Uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, just for starters, uh, let's just do a brief round of introductions. Hi everyone, I'm Benjamin. I'm from the Cheeto team. Hi, I'm Michael, um, Michael Novotny. I'm uh, the co-founder of Krypton Labs. Um, basically come out of academia and then worked in NASA Mansion for a while. We're trying to transform the way um, decentralized exchange works. Uh, what I realized at some point is that blockchains and Oracle networks basically allow me to invent whatever I want. No one can stop me. When I found Chainlink, I realized that we can just do it. Amazing. I'm uh, Joe Stecco, co-founder of Cryptex Finance. We build uh, fully decentralized perpetual markets on the Arbitrum network that are powered by Chainlink price feeds. Excellent. Thank you for joining me today, guys. Um, so yeah, let's dive into it. Um, you know, let's, uh, let's really talk about you know, where you guys uh, potentially maybe originally deployed or maybe you went directly to a multi-chain strategy, but kind of just uh, walk me through your thought process on, on why you started where you did. So, Ben. Yeah, um, so we're in a lot of chains. Uh, we like chains. Uh, <laughs> and there's a lot of them, uh, especially now there's a lot of L2s. Uh, at a time, there were a lot of L1s. Um, but yeah, we started on Polygon because we knew that the situation on Ethereum, like, you know, we wouldn't be able to really get a lot of people. And, and, and for us, it's always been about getting as many users as possible, bringing this uh, stable coin to many, as many people as possible, because you don't just want to have two, three whales on Ethereum. You know, you really want to get a lot of people. And so we started on Polygon because that was the chain that was doing the best at that, right? Even today, they have the most users of any chain, most transactions of any chain, so they're doing pretty well. But then very quickly, we saw that there were different niches and then different... Uh, chains like Phantom, like Avalanche, uh, Optimism, you know, and then it just got crazy. There's like so many chains. Explosion. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and so we started being on a lot of these different chains, uh, and that brought a lot of issues, a lot of barriers, because there was no, there was no cross chain, there was no bridges, there was no anything. Uh, I'm sure we get more into that, but we yeah, will. that's yeah. basically the first part. Michael. So there's basically value on different, very differentiated blockchains. What our plan is, is to deploy everywhere where DeFi makes sense. So that is mitigated via CCIP. One of the big problems with the proliferation of blockchains is that liquidity is going to be fragmented. And what we're aiming to do is have everyone, no matter what chain they enter from, be able to trade in a joint unified order book. When the banks come, when the institutions come, they will be on application-specific blockchains. So cross-chain is the future of Web3. But with that comes the challenge of this high hidden cost. Mm -hmm. Right now, even on single blockchains, trading is much more expensive than is in TradFi. If that problem isn't solved, institutions will stay out. What Krypton does is it very, very nicely solves for all these costs so that we will be able to live in this wonderful, beautiful, decentralized future enabled by CCIP. True. Somebody, uh, yeah. somebody heard the talk by Sergey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, truly multi-chain. Yeah. Very multi -chain. cool. Joe, tell, uh, you know, tell us on the Cryptex journey, right? where did you guys start and where, where you are today? Yeah, so we uh, founded the protocol in 2021. Uh, we built out a total crypto market cap solution, so it was essentially the market cap of the entire crypto space um, aggregated to reflect it, an index uh, price. We had the feeds powered by Chainlink. And uh, one of the issues that we saw originally was like just Oracle latency, because not only do you have peg issues of maintaining a peg on an index token, but you also have latency with regards to how the Oracles uh, function. So in June, we pitched to uh, building out like cutting edge perpetual markets, specifically on the Arbitrum network. And uh, we've made that journey now multi-chain and utilizing Chainlink to power the feeds and uh, plan to bring some really, really cool, novel, perpetual markets to the future thanks to uh, on-demand on price feeds. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, you know, and we kind of briefly touched on, on uh, a couple products here, but um, just in case we missed any, Ben, you know, what, what do you guys use uh, Chainlink services for and, and kind of how does it enable you to execute a multi-chain strategy? Yeah, I don't know how many of you guys saw this Sergey talk the other day, but uh, he had like a big map of everything that Chainlink does. And it's a lot, you know, they do a lot of different things, uh, very lofty goals. So 
Um, as such, we use Chainlink for a lot of things. Primarily, we use it to price our assets because we're a collateral-backed stablecoin uh, and backed by crypto assets. And so we need price feeds to, to price these assets, and we use a lot of them. I think we use over 80 price feeds on wow. a bunch of chains. I mean, like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a <laughs> lot amazing. of contracts, yeah. 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 And and we've suffered. I mean, we've seen the, the USDC peg, We've seen, like, the Luna crash, everything. And never have we had any issues with the Chainlink oracles at all, like, ever. And so... I mean, if it works, if yeah. it works, we'll keep using it. Gold yeah. standard. Well, I don't, we, we don't intend to let you down, Ben. <laughs> 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 uh, and then, uh, yeah, Michael, what, what Chainlink products are you guys going to be using at Krypton? Yeah, sure. So we're basically using Chainlink in two different ways. Mm -hmm. The one way is for decentralized off-chain computation. So if you think about Krypton, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's probably the most cost-effective trading mechanism that has ever been built and likely will ever be built. The problem is that it comes at an immense computational cost. Mm -hmm. Right now, there is no scaling solution. There is no layer one. There is no layer two that can allow Krypton to scale. So we need to, to invent a new solution, which we call Krypton Compute. It's based on Chainlink's decentralized Oracle technology, and it is what uniquely enables Krypton. Now, number two, what Oracles allow you to do is to connect all kinds of different decentralized ecosystems, and we're using this to the maximal extent. We're only using the blockchain for commitment and for settlement, nothing else. Some cryptographic verification, of course. And so mixing and matching different decentralized ecosystems allows us to use every kind of technology to its maximum potential. And so one of the things we're doing, for example, is doing state caching on IPFS. It's not a data availability solution, it's just for caching. And so having CCIP is a game changer because we can simply have one backbone blockchain that is inexpensive, secure, and communicates with the Chainlink Oracle network. Everyone else who wants to get in to Krypton will simply make a deployment, give their capital on whatever blockchain they are, and then trade on the, the backbone blockchain. So it's just, I think, a wonderful, wonderful synergy of many of the technologies that have been invented, and that synergy is ultimately enabled by Chainlink. Yeah. Great orchestration of multiple products at, at one time. Joe, uh, you know, you and I, we've, we've actually been able to you know, work closely together on, on some innovative things. So you dive into um, you know, what Chainlink products uh, you guys have used over the years and, and what, what's that meant for you guys? Yeah, so I think for us, when we first started you know, trying to build a, a total crypto market cap solution, uh, it, was, it was very limited in terms of how you could you know, get the data in a, in a very trustless manner. So we explored a bunch of different centralized solutions and none of them made you know, any sense. And then from Chainlink, you know, we were able to start with a total crypto market cap feed that blended five data providers, you know, had an aggregated price uh, of total crypto market cap, which we then further aggregated to make an index value. And that was kind of the first thing that we did. Then we um, wanted to kind of do an NFT index where we took a basket of NFTs and uh, worked with Chainlink and Coinbase Cloud in creating that. And, um, you know, these are all really, really great ideas, but I think for us, the, the biggest thing was just, you know, having the right latency because it's very difficult to, you know, have an index token where not only are you, are you worried about the index, but you're worried about like the latency in terms of updates of, of that index or of that value. So I think that, you know, now um, that you're looking at these on-demand price feeds, the limitations to what we can build from a perpetual level, working with the Chainlink essays and through the scale program with Arbitrum, it's pretty limitless what we can create in terms of decentralized perpetual markets. And now that you have low latency feeds, um, that's kind of what really excites me going forward is just the ability of, of what we can create, you know, go going forward with Chainlink, man. So it's, it's, it's been a great ride so far, but super nice. excited about a product direction and like where we go in the future, you know? Yeah, we have a bright future together. That's I, for I sure. agree. Yeah. And you touched on one thing. Um, so I want to kind of dive into it a little bit. You know, Chainlink has a program called Chainlink Scale. This is where we engage blockchain teams directly, and um, these teams um, come and they, they provide the subsidies for integration services and maintenance services, as well as um, Oracle subsidies through, um, throughout their networks, including gas costs. 
Now, this has been a very impactful program uh, for us as we've had hundreds of blockchains um, in the ecosystem, you know, kind of ask and some, sometimes demand chain link services. And it's very difficult to, you know, um, be able to service this demand on, on uh, lack of a better term, on a, on a grand scale. Um, but doing so and working with these blockchains, you know, it really enables um, not only for the gold star standard of chain link services to be delivered on said chain, but also allows you guys to build amazing products. So, um, you know, Ben, do you mind kind of touching into, you know, what scale has meant for you guys? And I love scale. Given, yeah. I'm so ready to show. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Look, if it wasn't for scale, uh, you know, nothing would be possible. Like, it's, uh, it's very expensive to run decentralized finance protocols because users just want to get as much as possible out of the protocols, and they want to pay as, as little as possible. And so the margins are very thin, and you've seen... Most stable coins outside of Ethereum have failed. I think it's like 95% failure rate because they don't uh, have a good mix of cost and revenue. And if we didn't have scale, I mean, it would destroy so many business uh, models uh, because it's very expensive to do everything that Chainlink does. I mean, Chainlink does a lot. And so scale has been amazing. Uh, and I'm sure other protocols can tell you that it's, it's crucial to have it. Um, yeah, so very, very happy about scale. Thank you, Ben. Michael, any so thank you. Uh, exactly. So blockchains used to be extraordinarily expensive, right? So think about back in the old days when Ethereum was basically the only way you could make decentralized transactions. Mm -hmm. Everyone wanted to be there. There's limited block space. So, you know, it's going to be expensive. So if you want to do anything at all where you don't get killed on these gas fees, the only thing you can do is minimize block space usage, minimize computation. And so maybe from 2016 to 2021 or so, the name of the game was optimize for gas usage at the cost of economic efficiency, right? And so now with the availability of scaling solutions, all kinds of things, you know, things like fast side chains, things like optimistic and zero knowledge roll up, things like, you know, chain link, the way we use it for computation. This is no longer the right trade-off to make. So in the future, the protocols will use more gas, they will use more computation somewhere, but they will optimize for cost efficiency, for economic efficiency. Now, the way we use multi-chain on Krypton is that if you want to get into Krypton, you just enter from whatever chain you're on. We minimize these transfers that you have to do. So even though we do continuous flow trading, we don't give you your money back piecemeal. Mm -hmm. You can ask for it out whenever you want. Now, the important cost that we have is when you enter Krypton and when you exit Krypton, because then we have to make a transaction via CCIP. And so I'm very, very happy that the scale program um, provides subsidies paid by these blockchain networks. And I'm really super happy to integrate with all the, black, the blockchains that work with scale. We got to get Vitalik to start paying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah seriously. <laughs> We're missing Ethereum on scale. L2s, yeah, for real. Yeah, and I would, I would kind of echo uh, Benjamin's sentiment a bit. You know, it's very costly, especially when you're deploying these solutions on an on a L1. Like, it's very costly for a project to be able to get their own data feeds. Uh, not only do you have to build the feed, not only do you have to create it, uh, you have to deploy it, you have to maintain it, you have to do all these different aspects. And... You know, especially when you're a, a small startup or dealing with different things, like these are very expensive measures. And, um, you know, when you have an opportunity to be in a scale network where you're looking at an L2 that's, you know, taking care of this for you, not only does it help you from a, a fee perspective because the cost is, is very small in comparison to what it was, but it's also helping you from a, a creation perspective because now you have several key people that you can contact for not only what you want to build, but like architecturally, um, you know, through the L2. And these costs are essentially like handled. And now you could just focus your team's efforts on building and necessitating like what you need to do to, to facilitate the best experiences that you can make for whatever reason you're using the oracles for. So I think scale has been remarkable for us. I'm very thankful to be a part of it. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much, pretty much my thoughts. Yeah, and, and we, we touched on a really key topic, and that is the, you know, the economic burdens that come with you know, decentralized networks and even decentralized Oracle networks as well. Um, you know, 
however, there, there's probably a, a number of reasons why you would choose um, to go to a certain L2 versus another. Um, can you dive into kind of what demand metrics or kind of pain points you look at before you, you know, add to your, I think, would you say 18 different chains Something that, like you're, that. Yeah, you're currently on? A lot of chains. It's uh, a lot of chains. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it might seem like, ah, these guys are just going to go all the chains. We could go on many more. I mean, there is, there is a lot of chains. And now everybody and their grandmothers is going to make an L2. Seriously. So, I mean, and then the neighbors too. I mean, yeah. it's like, and, <laughs> and everybody's just thinking like, you know, I want a sequencer. I want to make money. And, and they don't really think about like, am I going to build an ecosystem? Yeah, it's a fact. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, you have to look at that. You have to look like, will we make money if we launch on this chain? Because mm. uh, it's a money business, right? You're not just launching a stable coin just to launch it. Um, that being said, there are a lot of chains yeah. that are good. I mean, even though there's a lot, there's a lot of good ones. And so we, we focus on, number one is the team. Uh, I, I have to highlight Polygon as being one of the best teams to work with. Uh, and so, you know, when CKVM was announced, obviously we were like, okay, we're going to go there. Right. Because Polygon understands uh, what it takes to make um, a DeFi ecosystem, uh, what it takes to make uh, DeFi applications. Because there's some that, like, you know, they really focus on enterprise. They really focus on, on, on like, making Newswire articles, yeah. right? <laughs> and, and, and that doesn't do anything. And, and no. so we, we really look away from those. And so just focusing Optimism, Arbitrum, those are other. Arbitrum, I love Arbitrum. Uh, if you're voting on Arbitrum, uh, cheat out. It's uh, QIBAO. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So look, looking at uh, the teams is number one. And then number two is on and off ramps. So base, uh, easy, easy. Because yeah. they have Coinbase. And so, you know, you have easy USDC on and off ramping. And as a result, it has huge TVL with no incentives. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can't, you can't beat that. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ben. Michael, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, so you just mentioned cost, right? The cost of, of using an Oracle network. Um, we talked a lot about the benefits, mm -hmm. but the costs are basically you need to separately incentivize another decentralized ecosystem. It's not protected by cryptography. It's protected economically. But the interesting thing is that the economics are very different on an Oracle network than they are on a blockchain. On a blockchain, if you do twice as much work, you use twice as much gas, and if you don't move the price of gas, then you need to pay twice as much. On an Oracle network, if you do twice as much computation but secure the same value, you don't pay anything more. So this makes Oracle networks extraordinarily attractive. There's no impedance mismatch. If you think about the um, dynamics mm -hmm. of revenue for a DeFi protocol, which is basically proportional to trading volume, right. And the value that needs to be secured is also proportional to trading volume, roughly. If the cost you pay to the Oracle network is also proportional, then that's a good match. That's yeah. why we like Chainlink. Beautiful, beautiful. Very well said. Joe, Joe. Please. Yeah, I think, I think with regards to L2s, you know, for us, there were a lot of synergies with the Arbitron network. Um, you know, we had great relationships that we established there pretty early on. And um, it just made a lot of sense for us, you know, the community there was very supportive. Um, the team, you know, behind Offchain has been incredibly supportive and, you know, very thankful and humble to have that ability to, to work with, you know, Arbitrum. But to, to Ben's point, I think there's a lot of really, really great ones. I think Polygon is, is an example. I think Base, you know, has, has a, a, a ton of, of potential simply through the, the Coinbase exchange, um, you know, angle. And I feel like, you know, for us, Right now, being on Arbitrum, it's great, but eventually we, we will look to go multi-chain. I don't know if we'll get up to 18. Eventually, like, you'll make your own L2. Yeah, <laughs> eventually, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll build my own. Yeah. And then it could be like your grandma, your neighbor, and me. Yeah. So like yeah. That, that, that could be like super dope. Yeah. So, um, and then CCIP yeah. will connect everyone. <laughs> yeah, just connect yeah. everyone, and Sergey yeah. will be there talking. and yeah. it'll, it'll be a wonderful experience. So I'm yeah. sure you guys all look forward to that. But uh, no, I think, like I said, I think there's a ton of really cool examples um, and just, just happy to be where we're building and, and doing our thing. Yeah, L2s are really cool, especially in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, they've really, uh, you know, taken off recently. So, you know, um, we've, we've touched on the product a couple times, um, but, you know, we're, we're executing multi-chain strategies here. And Ben, you know, Cheetow, we've worked together on CCIP and you've, you've really kind of done some interesting things with that. Um, would you please kind of dive into what you guys are working on and yeah. uh, how you're using CCIP today? 
hundred percent. Yeah, I forgot to mention it earlier. No, uh, that's I saw my the marketing guy look at me like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, nobody is as Christian as Cheeto, uh, and we're one of the few teams that has a DAO that's been you know spreading to different chains. I can only think of maybe like Frax, you know, Ave. Uh, they've been actually doing a lot cross chain. The problem is that everybody relies on this web of multi sigs to actually execute changes on these different chains. Nothing is automatic. Nothing is as trustless as we think it is. Uh, and, and because there haven't been so many projects actually trying to grow to different chains, there's no tooling. Like, there's no Aragon of all the chains. And so what we did is we created an open source, free to use for anybody, uh, module on SAFE that works with the existing infrastructure that everybody uses, which is SAFE, uh, not SAFE. Um, and what this will do is it will allow for uh, people to use their saves to propose signatures to saves on other chains. Um, and it's very simple, the, the idea, but the actual applications are pretty uh, staggering. So the, the thing that I care most about is on-chain voting. You know, you want people to decide on something on-chain and for that decision to uh, trustlessly reach the contracts that it's, you know, deciding over. Uh, and using CCIP, we're able to execute that. Um, and, uh, you know, the number one thing, I mean, other, other bridges have talked to us about this before, um, but, uh, you know, opening your protocol up to these messaging layers is very risky. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like the core of your project, right? The management of your co smart contracts. Uh, but with Chainlink, I mean, we already trust Chainlink. They've been live for so many years and they've been okay. And so no new trust assumptions. It's literally the same thing that you used to you know, uh, um, like a report on like the price data is the same okay. for this. Yeah. Uh, and because of that, the risk team has been pretty open to uh, like adopting this for, for us. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, we've spent uh, five years uh, developing CCIP. Yes, you're, you're exactly right. Um, it is a series of, of uh, multiple networks that have, you know, sectioned off uh, security assumptions in each one. Um, we also have a a, um, a risk uh, management um, the arm. that yeah the arm sits the over the top um, and this is programmable so you can actually um, you know toggle it's a bionic arm. yeah <laughs> it's, it's a, it takes out the baddies um, this this enables you to program certain risk tolerance and limits on on uh, for instance uh, cross chain transfers so you could say hey um, we're only going to allow a thousand tokens to be tr be transferable over the course of say 60 minutes. And if there was an event where somebody tries to say send a million tokens at one time, the arm would uh, disallow this from from happening. So it is the uh, what we consider level five of the security um, network networks in in uh, what we've seen in the evolution of of oracles. Level one being a centralized server. Level two being a decentralized theater where one actor is, is, is operating both. Level three is a hub and spoke model where it's a shared trust assumption where if one, it, one spoke goes bad, the whole network goes bad. Um, you know, and we've seen some of these happens with oh, uh, uh, multi-chain. You know? <laughs> um, and then you know, level four is what we see with our data feeds and level five is what we consider CCIP today. And it's amazing. So. Uh, and, and I just really want to highlight how cool CCIP is because it's a generalized messaging layer, mm -hmm. and so you can do anything. I mean, talk about yeah. having like this world where everybody's going to have an L2, and you yeah. know that L2 is going to interact with everybody else. Um, you know, CCIP can do and it can transfer any sort of message, uh, and I think that's its real superpower. Yeah, and uh, so with that, doing anything, uh, Michael, CCIP for Krypton. I mean, you've touched on it a couple times. Anything else you'd like to? kind of dive into of, of what CCIP is going to be uh, unlocking for you guys? Yeah, I would like to say um, eventually probably synergies. So um, there are kind of two facts about Chainlink, I believe. If you look at chapter 9 of uh, Chainlink's 2.0 white paper, you see that the amount to successfully corrupt an Oracle network, the amount of money you need, is quadratic in the number of participating nodes. So that's what's called super linear staking. Mm -hmm. So if you turn that around and you ask yourself, how much money do we need on every node? How much stake do we need on every node to successfully secure X amount of value? That's X divided by N squared, maybe times some factor of proportionality, right? 
So because you have n different nodes in the network, the amount of capital that's required in the entire network is n times x divided by n squared, which is x over n. So that means if you need to incentivize the Oracle network to stake the amount that you need so they can get a fair yield on their link tokens, a fair risk-adjusted yield, it is both the average cost and the marginal cost are globally declining, which makes it a natural monopoly. So in the Oracle space, there will only be one winner. Now, on top of that, if you use the Oracle network for more than one task, one task being data feeds or cross-chain messaging or decentralized compute, then you do not need to incentivize the Oracle network over and above. So say you need cross-chain messaging. You get the decentralized compute for free because there's no more value that needs to be secured in that Oracle call. And so that will ultimately make Chainlink the winner. Okay. I and like that. Yeah. I like free. I like Chainlink the winner. Yeah, yeah. Those are all yeah, good. Those are all it, all, it all sounds yeah. good. You know, with scale attached, and you know, I think Sergey would be really excited yeah. uh, to hear that breakdown as well. So, um, I see what do. Yeah, know. yeah, with the <laughs> thumbs up. Um, you know, we're getting towards the tail end here, so I'd like to just kind of uh, go down the line and, and um, get your thoughts on, you know, as uh, blockchains continue to expand, um, where do you see the multi-chain world going? And, you know, is it L2s, L3s? Are we going to be at L4s one day? Um, how many floors are we going to be at? Uh, Joe, we'll, we'll start with you, man. Well, I think the, the L2 revolution has definitely been going on, you know, for, for a period of time. And I think there's going to be different L2s that have winners in terms of, you know, gaming or in terms of perpetual markets. Um, there's going to be all different types of winners and losers across that, that space. Uh, it's really interesting to see, like, where we are right now and especially with the current market cycle and what's going to be, like, are, are retail users going to be bridging to L2s in mass? Like, is there going to be a simple way for that to happen where the user doesn't even realize that they're bridging through their applications? Um, I'm excited to see what that looks like when that comes back. L3s are definitely going to be an interesting prop, but I'm not really sure that they're going to have too much um, happening because if you're, if you're using like a native token, you know, and the native token has limited liquidity or limited users, like how is that going to really, you know, facilitate? But I, th I think L3s, L4s, I don't know, L5s. Yeah. L6? I mean, L, 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 L7. Yeah. Why stop? I, yeah. I, I, have, I have no idea what, what's going to happen, but I think at the end of the day, just trying to build really, really cool stuff that connects with people is kind of what we're here for. And, um, you know, I can't wait to get back and start integrating these on-chain, on-demand price feeds and just bringing zero Oracle latency and making a bunch of cool stuff and seeing how people feel about it. Keep building. Ben, what, what do you think, man? How many? How, how far are chains. we going? A lot yeah? of chains. I don't know about L7s, yeah. uh, maybe L6. What about non-EVM? Any yeah, thoughts yeah. over there? You guys I, I actually think that it's all going to depend on you know how we're able to interact with existing stakeholders in the world, um, like financial institutions, etc. Uh, if we can convince them that it's important to have things decentralized, it's important to you know keep the ethos of crypto as it is today, uh, I think we'll see a bunch of L2s. But I don't think necessarily in Ethereum. I think maybe there's going to be different kinds of L1 systems mm -hmm. with their own L2s, uh, and, and we'll have this mesh. Obviously, CCAP is going to connect yeah. them all, you know, regardless of where they uh, get their consensus. Um, and yeah. so <laughs> that's, that's what I think. But it's, it, who knows, right? It's, it really depends on the stakeholders that actually have the money in the world that's and that true. haven't got into crypto. It depends what they think. That's true. And, and just to kind of round things out, you know, I look at blockchains as um, a tech stack and they all kind of uh, you know have their similar purpose and you know uh, chainlink is that that true middleware solution or that fluid that you know all all the chains dunk in and can can uh, communicate through so with that um, that is our you know executing multi chain multi chain strategy so thank you gentlemen for joining me today it was thank a true you. pleasure and uh, thank you for everybody for coming coming out. Thank today. you guys. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks.